my mind works just like yours. Sometimes it's just you think about vacation Bible school is all happy, and suddenly it's like, wow. You're having like a few hundred, like maybe 60, 100 of peachy dish running around. Just when we were worshiping, there's one day in your court is better than elsewhere. It comes to me to this memory that I have is one time I'm sitting there with my parents. We were on a resort. We were sitting there with just a table spread it out, the best continental breakfast. My dad was smiling. I never seen my dad smile so much. Of course, my mom is being a Chinese mom. She is just delivering food. I mean, mom, there is a full continental service with the spread out servers and everything. Nieces is running around, and it's just, I can hear the ocean crashing. The day was so perfect that not even my brother was annoying. And then we realized that sitting behind us, there is a family of friends that we knew. So we turned a breakfast into a gathering and a reunion. When I was thinking about that, and suddenly there was this thought just jump into my mind. $7, uh, $7 a gallon, and I begin to worry. We're prone to be like that. We can worry fast and worry easy. Now let me tell you something about me. Today we're keep on going on this series of, called Joy Killer. That is the stuff that will sap the joy of the Lord from us. We talk about from relationship to the past to having Pastor Caleb in here ripping money. You find out that we have put so much trust into everything else, but yet everything else is so fragile. We place our love in all the wrong places, and then we keep on putting our love into different places. Me, in my case, I'm a professional warrior. Like, not a warrior basketball. I can worry out from nowhere. Before I even know what the term worry is, I know how does it feel. It's this anxious feelings that you want to do everything that you could, the best you could, but don't even know what that is. You're trapping your own self. You just feel this sense of anxiousness. First time, I got this feeling. It was in Hong Kong. I was going from kindergarten to first grade. For, for some of us who doesn't know, Hong Kong is a place that you can be poor, but you cannot be not educated. You wear the school uniform like a place of armor. This is your status symbol because that's how much they place values on school. First thing they ask the chick, child is, what school do you go to? It is that if you go to the wrong school, you are less of a person. So there was a summer that my mom dragged me everywhere to have an interview for, for going to elementary school. I just learned all my shapes and ABC, and suddenly I went in there having an interview where the whole interview is given to me in English. Reminds you, I was six. I don't speak any English. I mean, of all the alphabets, I only know like 24 of them. Seriously. I was stressed because if I don't get into a school, I'm not going to be anyone. The second time I feel this way is when I was growing up. My family always tell me the stories about my dad's being sick. About, I was not even two years old. My dad tried, uh, uh, contracted a, a sickness where he has to be hospitalized for a long, long time. And then he was also family economic, so he was staying in the general populations. And somehow back in the days, there's no cell phone. We gathered together and he called home. And then my mom said, that was when you first said dad dad over the phone. And I, all I can hear is dad's crying. And through all my life, I'm in my 50s, my dad got sick a lot. And every time he gets sick, my mind is all over the place. I want to do this. I want to see this specialist. I want to try to get this. Even last couple of times, I was trying to get Pastor Paul to buy nebulizing medicine for my dad. This angst, this sense of anxious and worry. So today, I'm going to be talking about a bit of worry and anxiety. It is that last couple of times we identified these elements. But right now, I want to talk about this general sense of anxiety where we're all feeling. But maybe I can say this is a general sense, but it is a general sense that almost everyone gets it. And some studies say that even one out of five Americans feel anxious, or even they say that one out of five Americans is feeling depressed. And medical, this is, medical research has said that if you're worried long enough, you're anxious long enough, you're going to be depressed. It's this sense that you want to grab hold of everything. You want to do all that you could to protect yourself, but you don't know which one it is. You hang on too much. 
Eventually, just the system is so much, it overwhelms you, and you just say, I can't take this no more. But I'm going to make an argument. I'm going to make an argument. I some observations, too. From what I learned that Americans as one of the most stressed out people there is. You think about it, that's weird. Wouldn't that be in Afghanistan or Mexico or somewhere that, you know, they have less privilege? And here we have one of the best systems there is, yet we are the most stressed out people. And I'm going to make this claim. It is because that we have put our ultimate hope into joy on everything but God. See, in older generations, this is probably my parents' generations, they put all their hope and joys into these things called loyalty, friendships, and honor above all else. But we know that these things is also fragile. In my generations, it's about career, putting this into living the right school district, raising the right kind of kids. They have the right uniform, and if they don't do that, we're stressed out. You have to drag your kids everywhere to go into a different school. The millennials nowadays is feeling that they need to do entrepreneurship. If they don't change the world, they're stressed out. You ever watched, uh, read this little girl, this Swedish um, environmentalist, is uh, Greta Thunberg? They're killing the world. She scares me. And then to the last generations is anything that you change themselves. It is almost the ideology that, that you let me be myself. Don't change me. You change every bit of me. I get stressed out. Again, when we place any bit of our hope, our ultimate hope, our ultimate visions of bringing hope to the people around us, but God, you get stressed out. So today's verses is gone from Philippians. Let me read it for you. In verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I said it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petitions, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, sin sisters, whatever it is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When you read this, will you think that Paul is underestimating the power of stress? When I'm stressed out, when you tell me to not stress out, I am mad. I am mad. It's not like I wanted to. It's not like I welcome these things, but these things just capture me. They get a hold of me. But why would Paul say that? Does he know anything about stress and anxiety? But my argument is, is that he does. He's writing this letter in jail. This is exactly where his place of living is being questionable. Even in the Roman system, when you're in jail, that your friends and family is support to support you. It is perfectly okay for the Roman government to starve you to death. Not only that, you have to pay for the guy sitting next to you. Imagine you're only going to jail, you have to pay the salary of your jailers. And then on top of it, while the Philippian is sending Paul the support, the guy who sent it, like today, I am I'm so sick. I'm so sick, I can't do anything. And you guys sent Rudy to come and take care of me, and in between that, Rudy got sick too. I'm stressed out. He's stressed out taking care of me, and you guys are stressed out for the both of us. Everyone is stressed out. Even mentioned to the fact that this little church that Paul has found back in Acts is under attack. Weird people is coming in telling this and that. There is su they're suffering from internal turmoil. Oh, right before we get to here when Paul said rejoice, rejoice, it specifically talk about two sisters disagreeing. As boys know, man can disagree. But as all men know, we fear that when women disagree. Ah, we're stressed out. My wife is not here. When she fight my mom, I curl up in a ball. It's scary. It's scary. 
tiger going against tiger. <laughs> I, I put earphones on, and my, me and my daughter, we crawl up, and like we watch Berenstein Bear until it stops. Scary. Every reason to be stressed, but he said, rejoice, rejoice, and rejoice. Now, I don't know what caused you to be worried, but I want to jog your memory to a time that when there is no worry in your life. When would that be? Maybe you don't remember it. But if you take a look in the baby's room, that is designed everywhere there is to have no stress. Will you ever go into the baby's room and as soon as the baby's open eyes, there's a 1040 easy form? There's a text form. No, it wouldn't. Would it be a DMV test? No, it wouldn't. Would that be something scary? No, it wouldn't. It's all in pinks and baby blue. Everything is plush. It's got squishy stars and everything cute. It is the same thing that God made us to have, is to have joy and not anxiety. In Genesis 1 and 2, when he created us, you know, how is he doing that? It, people said it's seven times good, but I see it as seven spheres of good. It's good upon good upon good and upon good. Now, I don't know is it to call it perfect, but it is pretty good. So today when we worry about eating, we worry about living, we worry about work, we worry about our rights, we worry about all of this. In Genesis 1 and 2, there is no such things. Deeper into this. Will you care about what you eat? Yeah, you do. You eat the wrong thing, processed food, keto diet. It looks like you're not healthy. But in Genesis, God gave you sevenfold. He gave you food that is so good to eat. That will make whole food look dumb. God certify. One time, I think this is in Thailand. I can't remember. It's in Thailand or Mexico. I ordered one of those. It's called the president. I think it's in Mexico. It's a presidential fruit basket. It was quite a lot, but I ordered it anyway because I feel like splurging. So I thought it was a fruit basket. No, it's not. It's a fruit, it's a fruit table. Remember Chinese? Remember star fruit? Yang Tou. I had it in, 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 in Mexico. And then this thing, this star fruit, they dip it in um, chili powder. And it was super good. Pineapple so ripe. Mango, you just want to scrape your face on it. I was like, this is how good it is. You don't even want to have anything else but that. It was seven times good. The place you live, in Hong Kong, you buy a house, you want to face south. And here you face north, east, south, and west. It's all good. It's all good. Today, when we stress out, we want our kids to go to the right school, to send to the right college, so they can be what? They can get the right job. So they can get to a management position. And think about what our job is back in Genesis. We all like to be at least middle or upper management, right? Our job in Genesis is to, under God's blessing, to multiply, subdue, and rule. You're not man of management. You're upper management. All there is up there is the power and authority of the creator. Don't argue with me. This is where you can say, if you have any problem with me, you talk to my boss. Oh, by the way, that's the creator. That's authority right there. Look at your job. Do you have any right? God didn't train you to be a robot. He gave you free wills. Peter, today we're really, really tense about freedom of speech. Anytime you infringe that, we go nuts. But think about the freedom of speech when you have Genesis. When you name an animal, you are the animal. You're lions. It's like, oh, yeah. But then you're platypus. It's like, why? He's lion. Give me something cool. But nope, that's it. Not only you have the freedom of speech, your naming is being supported and authorized by God. There is no stress. I'm going to make another claim. God make us to have no stress. So therefore, the departure of God is stressful. You see it in Genesis 3, when you start departing from God, first thing you see that you are naked and ashamed. Why would that be? Because for the first time you look at each other, you know without God's this is moral, without God's rule, without his sense of right and wrong, this is what we can do to each other. We got stressed out. So stressed out that we're wearing fig leaves, hiding. 
stress, and worry. And that's exactly what we want to talk about because this is one mechanism that the Satan wants to use and to further divide us from God. The enemy wants that. The enemy wants to use this. So today, I think somehow in our collective memory, we remember how good it was. It's just like we were saying, the moment we say, the, mo- the worst one day in your court is better than a thousand elsewhere. You know what comfort is. You don't have to explain comfort to anyone. It transcends all languages. Love, loyalty, being loved, being loyal to. You know how that feels because we realize that long ago, this is what we were made for. But now that we have departed from the giver of love, peace, joy, all these things, support, stability, status, right, then we want to grab a hold of anything. In Romans, it's said that we will bow down to anything that gives us a temporary pleasure, that temporary identity, this fading goodness. We hang on to it. We say, give me that sensation. We take any counterfeit. So, when these things fade, worry comes in. We'll take a look. You don't take my word. You take a look at some, some people who have made it. Recently, there has been big news. Was Will Smith going out there up to slap Chris Rock? But look at it. These guys are A-listers. These guys are already perfected in the craft Will Smith, his wife, is probably one of the most, mo- at least I don't know the most beautiful, but she is definitely on the tears of beauty. But in the moment you mark or even joust about her beauty, people reacted. You look at Will Smith, when his ultimate joy and ultimate whatever it is that he's to put on his wife, when his wife is on this pedestal, she rolled her eyes, he went on killing he is still facing the consequences of it. We look at the same thing. The guy from Pirates of the Caribbean. I love that guy. I used to remember watching him in 21 Jump Street. I don't know if you remember. I know you do. He's good looking then. He's still good looking now. But look at when people who have made it in the sense of their art, in the sense of accomplishment, when they put their hope into what they thought will give them the ultimate joy and pleasures, they end up being in court. It's crazy. We look at the other thing is it's like, I feel this really bad for me. When I look at today's one of the top U.S. gymnasts, her name is Simone Bile. She's the only girl that will score a perfect 10 on gymnastics, but she has to bow out from Olympics because when she thought she could not perform at that level, she suddenly stressed out. It is only represented that her life is to score gold. Anything less, people will not accept her. Rihanna, the girl who sang the Umbrella song. She's love. She is an artist. Her song is so playful, so playful, so poppy. I love the way it is. She can sing and dance, but one day they said that when Lady Gaga is across town having a, 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 a concert, she feels stressed out. She feels that more people like Lady Gaga, more people is actually going to hate her. Where does it come from? It's because they put all their hope and joy into their own versions of God. Counterfeit. Recognitions. Applause. If I can produce for you, if I can grab this, I will have the ultimate joy. But when that is not God, it is no good. But we want to talk about what is worry anxiety. In a sense that worry is a mechanism, is it coming from your midbrain? When you're feeling worry, it is exactly what it does. It's fire up some signal and your body chemistry is just, just fired up. And then what it does is that you're on a sense of alert, fight or flight. You don't know what's going on. You don't know where to run, but you're on all alert. You're scanning. But also this is at the time that when you're forelope, it's your logical sense is being the weakest. Because of course it's right. You're diversing all the CPU power into like, whoa, what's going on? That's what anxious is about. Also anxious is when you're anxious, your body becomes so acidic. And your body has become acidic, you're a phone to cold. See, when you stress out at work, what do you do after that? You get sick. 
you get sick. That's what stress does to you. It's no good. When I was studying this, I was actually for the first time I look at the Chinese character in the writing of the word worry. It is a house with seven thoughts. You don't know which one it is. Is exactly how it feels. It's like I want to grab a hold of it. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's that. Let me try. And the more you're trying to get a hold of everything, you're being stressed out, and it's just like I am stretched to the limit. In Bible, it is that the same thing. It is being pulled to the opposite direction. It's exactly what Bible is saying. The word worry is. But I will even add a little bit more. It's when you're pulled, you're being pulled away from the ultimate joy, and this is why you feel stressed. On the reversed, what is rejoice? What does rejoice mean? Rejoice doesn't mean happiness. Will Smith have happiness. Johnny Depp, even suing his wife, getting ten million dollars. If you look at how much he's worth, ten million dollars isn't that much for him. But it isn't happiness. It isn't something that you can buy. It isn't a circumstantial thing. Rejoice is exactly what it is. It's the definition is the inclinations to the dispositions of God's grace. What does that mean? You know where God's grace is. You're willing to lean toward it. You put your weight into it. You act toward what is good for you. It is to trust Him, to seek Him, to further explain this. Remember, every Christmas we sing this song: Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel. That's exactly what rejoice is. I trust. I trust because He's coming. This place. It's going to get a renovation and a restoration. This inside, it's going to get renewed. All this brokenness, all this stress done to this body, he's going to fix. This is joy. It's to be with him again. I want to explain a little bit more. Feeling joy in the Lord doesn't mean that you let go in life. It means that you can hang on, you can thrive, but you don't hang on to death. Before that, I'll give you an example. We talk about all these success stories. Recently, it comes to this story. It's about In-N-Out Burger. I wouldn't say In-N-Out Burger is the best burger, but goodness gracious, for bang for the buck, they give you the best. Seriously, my daughter and I can go to In-N-Out Burger for under ten dollars. Both of us is fees, and then we got that fries in animal styles. And every now and then, we want a treat. We'll get that shake. That shake is so thick. Always fun to watch her go into that shake and see her's like, mm, it's like, oh, this is good. I love In-N-Out Burger. So when they talk about this, they were actually talking about the owner and CEO of In-N-Out Burger. It's a lady, and the lady is actually a follower of Jesus. We really transform In-N-Out Burger is her own life experience because I I don't know how many times, I think she said she'd been married four or five times. That means she gone through five divorces. She have gone through five love separation, but at the end, she realized that the only thing she can trust is God. Therefore, she created a food chain that it just doesn't really care about your order on the app. He, she wants you to come in, and we'll make them fresh for you. It's an experience. It's, it's just like to not just give you food, but it's in the food to shake your hand, so that it will be okay. You look at all in and out. This is little paperwork. There is Bible verses. It's like he. She said, "Why?" People ask her, "Why do you do that? Why are you so weird?" And she did only this. She said, "This, I want to please him." So my big argument is that that if you do everything in the joy and incline to God, not only you can do it better, you don't have to do it to death. I'll give you an example. Most of us middle-aged guys, we know to work ourselves to death is to provide for the family, because security is the ultimate joy. If I don't provide for my family, maybe I'll lose my identity. But God said, you don't. You work till enough. You go home, not because of your poor bosses or bosses, because you have got your job done. Because your job is your life. You still have to go home and take care of your wife. What's the point of buying her everything that you can't be there? What is the point that you can take your kids to a $250 Disneyland trip that you go and you are completely tired, you're cranky? But being in love with me is to understand the season that you are a complete person. I'll give you another example. I like to talk about example today. Told me an example. I usually know a girl. All her life is to be a, a, a medical student. 
to go to med school. And she does. She is excellent at this. She hang on to med school is, is like the everything there is in her life. Sometimes I joke around, say, med school is your God. And she wasn't even joking. She said, yes, true. That's true. But at the end, when she become a doctor, I'll tell you that she is one doctor that no one wants to see. She's completely annoyed at you. She has a sense that it's like, you're not good enough for me. She look at all her cases. Because this is exactly, if you're self-driven, excellent, if you're excellent, you manage to graduate in that med school, get that grade, get that kind of certificate, then you will be joy. Then I, then I can help people. But God said, it's through me. You can thrive. You can help people as a complete person. I hope I get the point, of course. So this is what God wants you to do. So when we do everything through God, we actually can do better. You can study better. You can like a child to discover the joy of chemistry. When I was learning computer science, why I failed is because I thought that if I cannot learn computer science, I become a total toe. I will not be an engineer. But you know, when I first started really light programming is when I play World of Warcraft, when I'm writing macros for all my clan. This is to do what? Then I found so much joy and you can sit in front of it. Next thing you know, you wrote so much code and everyone's like, hey, I really like these macro that you're writing. We're all using it throughout the clan. When you love something, whatever that produce is better. So I'm saying that whatever you love God, when you love God, whatever that flow out from you is better. It's not bitter. But then we want to answer the questions. When we're stuck in this place, when we're stuck in this place, we'll already worry about $7 for gallon. When we cannot help it, what are we going to do when mom and dad's life or his health is fading or f- just weakening? What can do? Paul gives an answer. So counterintuitive. I don't know how he figured it out. So I can only think this is the joy of the Holy Spirit. But he said in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. This is not to plead with you. I think it's a twofold. When in old Hebrew, when they go echo, double-double, it is mean that you need to pay attention. This is being amplified. It's rejoice square. Why would he do that? First thing you need to tell yourself is like, snap all of it. You are meant for joy. When you're feeling this way, your anxiousness is pulling you down to your depression. When you can think about nothing but want to fix the church that you started. You want to know where your next meal is coming from. And yet the guy who sent you the money for the meal is being sick. I couldn't even go help him. And I'm chained to a Roman soldier. Rejoice. Snap out of it. Snap out of it. Hit the reset button so you can think. Think about how good God is. Think about that even then when someone is sick, he's willing to care for you. So the first thing to do is a joy. It's joy is the killer of anxiety. This series is talking about joy killer is anxiety. So the answer is anxiety killer is joy. It's to grab hold of God. God will never set us in the wrong place. But he wants to know that security, identity, your livelihood, your worthiness, your ideology can only be leading to him because everything is from him. When you're trying to find counterfeit, this is a reset button. This is a warning for you. When you feel like you need to fight or flight, you need to think, where do you flight to? In Jeremiah 29, 11, it said that, For I know the plans I have for you, declared the, war, the, the Lord. Plans to prosper you, but not, and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. But that plan has to be in my plans. We just talk about an experience with God. God is not here to fulfill your wish. God is here to do His will and inviting to do with, with Him. And His plan is so much better. We've done some construction work before. You, you want to jerry-rig something or you want to look at the plan by a cert- certified civil engineer. When people start rigging weird stuff and that's when the buildings got a little funky and, and, and weird. That's why we have code. He's inviting us to do his plan. He's like, I know. Why, why would I harm you? I created you. It bothers me to harm you. It bothers me that you are harmed. But then this is what we do. We like to go after the false things. 
So in Romans 14, 17, it said that for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Especially we have young people here. Today is about making an impact, about changing the world, about fighting for right, fighting for free speech, fighting for people's identity. But God said, I'm already doing that. You think, in Jewish law, when you farm the land for seven years, you give the land Sabbath. Even donkey get a vacation out of it. You think I don't understand that? When the world suffer, I know. That's why I want you guys to understand how much I love you and how much you not understand the world's operating. You see in your, what your eyes can see, but I see the seen and the unseen. Trust me in this. We are going to be the biggest environmentalists. That's why when God comes back, it is heaven coming down to earth, earth and we are going to rework all these things. You want to make an impact? That's how. Not long than that. If you want to talk about justice, this is not social justice. This is cosmic justice. Not just one level of justice, it's justice in a whole. And I want you to be partnering with me. Wouldn't that give you more meanings to that? But in verse 5, it said that let your gentleness be evidence to, to all. The Lord is near. When I was reading about this, I was preparing for this message, I was a little stressed out. What does that mean? Because it sounds like this stop stressing, God is coming. It's like, stop tripping, your boss is coming. It's like, no, my boss is coming. That's why I am stressing. But more I look at it, it is the fact that this is the opposite. I would actually dare to even say that the Lord is near, so let your gentleness be evidence to all. This is what it means. Not that he's coming to judge you. It's said that Jesus has given you a piece of him. He knows that when, when we left the Garden of Eden, that big old holes in your heart, the security that you need to feel, the love that you want to yearn, the loyalty, the friendship, the justice, all the brokenness and there is left a hole in your heart. But then in here, the Holy Spirit is here. He's to hold that space. That's what he meant. I already given you peace. You have to go in there and put in the activation code and then to let it run. The Lord is near. I am already with you. It's a statement of confidence. Is because you found out what the gospel does so much that Jesus had come and filled that hole on the cross. So therefore today when you're worried, get out, rejoice. It's a command. From that point, what flows out? It's a power. It's a power of gentleness. It's a power to wash this little bitterness out. That is the evidence that you can see. Not to show the next person. It's you can't help it but to just pop outward because people know you're stressed out. And when you suddenly take a break and it's like, you know what? I am redeemed. You know what? I'm not going to hang on. Instead of thinking this will save me, holding on to death, why I'm stepping onto this, I'm being stressed so far. God said, you know, to do what? What is prayer's hands to do? Stop it, let go, open your hand, put them together and point it upward. I got you. So he said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petitions and thanksgiving, present your request to God. It's like, I know, you dug yourself in a hole. I know what you want, tell me. A couple of things we learned from experience, God, is that when you talk in your prayer, you actually, for the first time, hearing yourself. Maybe God is giving you the time to say, think about it. Think about it. I have a six-year-old. She's so sweet. But sometimes she got the craziest idea. When she come in and tell me all these things and stuff like that, I let herself think herself out. She's like, Daddy, I don't need to take a shower. I'm really dirty. But I'm going to watch TV in bed. And I'm going to have ice cream. You want me to be happy, right? I mean, I mean, I look at her. I don't want to say anything. She's like, Dada. And I look at her. I'm not mad. Then in her mind, she says like, oh, mommy doesn't like me to be in bed dirty. I say, yes. But I say, I have a little TV time, right? I say, of course. But I say, how about I'll go take a shower first. And you help me dry my hair. And then we make a nest in bed. 
And then we watch a little TV. Aha, you figured it out. When you put my law, my will, my goodness as the whole of your life, you figured it out. So what else we do in the Lord's Prayer? We pray for your kingdom, your will, because when we uh, actually stress out, I believe that sometimes it's because our kingdom, our will is become too heavy for us to, 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 to carry. It's just too much. But when you transfer into here, you see a bigger picture. He said, you can absolutely pray to me. Come before me. Come before me. Also, this is a chance to repent. It's like sometimes you feel silly. It's like more you think about it. It's like, Lord, I got here because I dug this hole myself. Now I fall into this hole. I twist up my ankle and then I can't get out. I can't pedal myself out. He said, I got you. Calm down. Stop flinging your arms around. Look at the hands I'm already reaching out for you. Take it. We can do this. In 1 Peter 5, 7, it said that cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. It's not just like, he <laughs> cares. It is like, ew, why would I be carrying this? I'm already stuck in the hole. Next thing you know, I'm still grabbing onto everything. Let go. Let go. Even more to a little bit of a context. You know what? Let me read you to you. Actually, the, front, it, it, the, the, the surrounding verses on 1 Peter 5, 7. It actually said, God opposed the proud, but show favor to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he might lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone who to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergo the same kind of suffering. When you stress out, we can read it. You don't think the devil can understand that when you stress out, he coming here, oh yeah, he's stressed. He's stuck in a hole already. Dig deeper. Maybe you find a way out. Fall before me. I will lead you out. Try this harder. Blame it on your family. They're the one who weighs you down. Blame it on your boss. But whatever you do, don't look at yourself. But in here, it just said that it's the opposite. God does not like the proud because the proud will never look in herself. But when you're humbling before God, it's like, wait a minute. Reset. I am the problem. And God said, you know what? Bingo. I'm here. Let's get you out of this. Then you cast it out. It's like, get away of these lies. Get away of these things that you think you can help yourself. So the peace of God, when verse 7 said, which transcend all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Well, because the Bible said that it is beyond all understanding, so I'm not going to try to unpack this verse. But I will tell you a story. I usually get all stressed out about when my dad is sick because I've seen crazy things. I've seen him poop blood. It freaks me out. But not until one day I was so sick that I'm looking at my daughter in the exact same age when I call my dada, dada, he's in hospital. I learned one thing, I ain't in control. I got IV, two IVs in one arm, three IVs in another. I got a catheter in my back and then a catheter somewhere else. I couldn't even move, but yet I was stressing out. I couldn't even fill up that what if it's uh, in Kaiser, it's the, it's the end of life things. I forgot what is it called. So he's talk about what, what um, ceremony you want to go through, how you want to be, uh, end of term thing. I forgot what is it called. But Kaiser make you fill up a thing. I couldn't even fill it up. They put it in front of me. I feel so helpless. I couldn't even tell them how I want to die. And at that moment, I realized that I am completely out of control. Then I said, you know what? I will be done. It's been a good life. At least I got to figure this out. It's when I let go of this, I am not proud. I'm not in control no more. God said, I got you. And the first things it does is when the presence of God comes in. People always talk about the presence of God as this and that. The presence of God to me, it is that joy, this aggressive joy is running all the anxieties out. It wasn't that it was running the anxiety out. Anxiety ran out itself. And that joy fills me. 
And the next day, I look at the nurse. It's like, can we go for a walk? She's like, yeah. Yeah, we can go for a walk. Things change. It's unexplainable. It is not me. I know it is not me. So I'd rather testify and tell you how it worked, but it is something that's worth trustworthy. That's why the last verse says this in verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Now, we just take a class from Pastor Learn. He said, when we are preaching, don't, don't talk bad about other people's religion. But I just want to compare. I'm not talking bad about anybody else. Because I have experience in the time that, remember, I was 10 years as an atheist. But I did learn that this is the power of Buddhist meditation. In Buddhist meditation, it teaches you that when there is suffering, when there is all these things you do, you empty yourself. To the joy that there is all joy, all suffering, everything is gone. Then you transcend. That is the most lonely place there is. When you go to that place, I'll tell you, I will rather be suffering. I'll rather feel something than nothing. But in here, the Bible said that it is not. And when you look at this, when you fill your heart with brothers and sisters, what is true that Jesus Christ lived, what is noble, the cross has substituted all our pain into goodness. And that is not the right thing, but yet this is His righteousness for Him, for us. That is how pure His love it is for us. What else can be more lovely than that? What else can be more admirable when I lay my eye on Jesus? I will begin to be excellently praised and worthy because I will reflect that goodness. You absorb your mind about not you, about what good you can reflect off from Him. It is to fill your heart, fill your heart with the Holy Spirit. And that is the complete remedy that Paul is talking about, I believe. But you have to do it with brothers and sisters. Why is that? Because some of us have walked through that path. Some of us know what is it like to lose hope. Some of us know that what is it like to be put trust in loyalty and loyalty fleet on us. Some of us don't know what is it like to put all your hope in education and education did not redeem the position that you want. Hard work. And not to be casting aside or make fun of anyone, parents. So much Asian parents put all their hope in their child and the child could not produce excellence at their level of excellence. They will freak out. But when we think about that, when we replace it, when we cultivate each other, when we just nourish each other, you don't have to be if you cannot rejoice, I will rejoice for you. That's why God put together. It's a fail-safe. Holy Spirit's in here and brothers and sisters around. So when you need to be, when you can't get up, lift up your hands. We'll rejoice for you. Brother and sister, there is all kinds of things out here will stress you out. Things that you haven't even think about is going to stress you out. We have a presidential election coming. It's almost like you vote for one party, that means you're damned by the other party. It's like the worst gambling there is. Racial tension, sometimes even as a pastor, we're locking the door, always looking at who's coming in, gun violence. But in here, I proclaim that the last minute of wherever, however long I will live, I will rejoice because I know he lives. Brothers and sisters, let me pray for you that you will have this joy. Let's bow our hand and pray. Father Abba, we come before you to cast our worry heart because we have long forgotten how good your plan is. Lord, we have tried. Lord, it is not that I say my brothers and sisters are the best. Sometimes you just want to show you that, Papa, I can do this. But when we realize that, Papa, when we let go of our hand to you, we become feeble. And again, Father God, we ask you to hold our hand, to find our hand. Sometimes we're holding on to so many things that we even become so stressed out. We forgot to free up our hand to hold yours. We ask you to clinch onto our hands and let us know the security, the comfort, the joy, the love, that how much you already approve of us because of what Jesus has done. Lord, today let us just continue to wash our heart with your goodness, to think about your word, to devote ourselves into understanding, pursuing you. And it is to lift out our faith by echoing this to with all these uh, brothers and sisters around us, to our neighbors, to our friends, or to those who need a loving hand. Lord, I ask you to continue to use us. As the summer is about to approach, Lord, I pray that the young people will go out with safety. 
Lord, but at the end, it is your alertness. Even though when there is something drastic happened, Lord, we pray that our mind is calm. We can see that your goodness is with us. We can think clearly, not fight or flight, but it's to lead with righteousness and goodness. Lord, I pray for all our brothers and sisters, especially for our brothers that is in Hong Kong, going through quarantine, visiting. Lord, we pray that your joy is with him. You protect him from the immune system. We pray for our elderly parents at home who is, who is becoming weak, aunts. We pray for our sisters and brothers who are not here, who is actually at home just working through things that is just weighing them down. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that the Holy Spirit's work in a way that we don't understand, but that you do, that you will transcend and you will free them from distress. Lord, we bow ourselves in front of you to recognize that you are Lord. Ask your joy to come in. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.